it's <laughs> okay. Um, so there's three types of, uh, of, of mycorrhiza. So there's arbuscular mycorrhiza, which are the most uh, primitive, let's say. Then there is the ectomycorrhiza, and then there is another one that is ericoid uh, mycorrhiza. And so just to give you an idea, so you have a, a little tree here, which is about 10 centimeters, and you have like a very large network of, of fungi that you see here. This is the white uh, AZ networks right below this uh, in the ground here. Um, <clears throat> they sustain a very large amount of the, uh, of the plant biosphere, let's say. Um, here you have uh, a very nice study that, I, that is from two years ago. And you see the different types of uh, mycorrhiza and the amount of uh, biosphere, plant biosphere that they sustain. So you see that uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza are mostly centered on the uh, equatorial uh, forest and ectomycorrhiza are more in the, uh, let's say, temperate to uh, cold uh, 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 biomes. And then you have uh, ericoid, which is really uh, ericoid mycorrhiza, which is really specialized for a uh, very cold uh, climate. And then you have uh, the non mycorrhizal plants that represent only a fraction of the forest. So basically the take home message of this slide is to say that, uh, I mean, most of the plants are uh, sustained by these uh, large networks of, uh, of fungal, network, of, uh, fungal uh, filaments. Um, why is so? Because the fungi provide nutrients, key nutrients for the plants. And in exchange, the plants uh, give a bit of their uh, carbon that they assimilated from uh, photosynthesis, pho photosynthesis. So it is estimated, it's quite hard to quantify this flux from, of carbon to the uh, fungal network, but let's say it's between five and 15%, sometimes people are saying up to a third of the uh, carbon assimilated during photosynthesis is transferred but this is really um, it depends on the, uh, the, the 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 two partners basically um, <clears throat> so this is this is pictures from uh, uh, Jonathan Link from uh, University University of Sheffield and really you see that um, here in this uh, on the right panel you see that the radioactivity so they labeled uh, CO2 gaze with uh, C14. And you see that the radioactivity is really uh, well uh, centered after certain times of uh, like 24 hours, I think. Uh, you see that the radioactivity is concentrated to the growing part of the system. And so basically this, this uh, network filaments, they are really able to uh, interact with the minerals way more efficiently than the uh, the root of these uh, plants. So they are really the interface between the plant and the soil is really mostly uh, fungi. So I like this, this wording from uh, Jonathan Leake. He's really the master of this uh, mycorrhiza. They are really networks of power and influence um, because basically they, they, the conditions, uh, the, the plants, they really can access minerals that, uh, that are inaccessible to the plants because of their really, um, really large ratio of uh, surface to volume. They are really much more favorable, these very fine filaments to go in the porosity of the soil, detect the uh, interesting minerals and exploit them or organic matter also that they help to degrade. So they are really important for the, for the plants. Um, they transfer these nutrients uh, from plant to plants also, that has been shown in, in forest. Um, they are also able to, uh, they are kind of a, a reserve of water for, uh, for the vegetation. So they are really, really important for the, for the, um, for the plants. Uh, some, you know, uh, some studies shown that their uh, forests that were uh, linked to this mycorrhiza, uh, they are able to sustain, uh, you know, they are more resistant to drought, for example, and they are uh, quicker to recover from uh, drought periods as well. So they really, uh, in many aspects, they are really important for the whole biosphere, basically. So in my work, I really specialized in this, uh, in the later aspect about mineral weathering. 
because uh, these um, fungi they are well equipped to access nutrients um, uh, in a, in quite difficult setting, let's say in minerals uh, that are inaccessible to exudate from uh, root plants, uh, the fungi can really go in and uh, do the job for the plant. And this relationship is super important for the uh, uh, since the beginning of this coevolution between plants and and fungi. So some part of my work has been dedicated to really understand how the this process of uh, uh, mineral weathering could be accelerated by the uh, fungi. So here you see really um, two nice pictures, one from uh, uh, an ex colleague of, of mine, uh, Gadze. Uh, and this is an AFM view of, uh, of an IFE and you see on the mineral and you see that uh, you have the IFA and you have like this uh, bio layer all around. And what I've been doing is really looking at this interface between the, the, the minerals here and the, this IFA. And here you see on the top right, you see, a, 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 so this is a slab of, uh, of granite that has been colonized by a network of IFA. So you see the density of this IFA is really phenomenal and they really exudate this, um, EPS layers that really, uh, um, uh, let's say, condition the, uh, the, the, the macro environment all around the, uh, this IFA. So I've been doing a lot of experiment using these uh, microcosms. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, we reproduce really crudely uh, this, uh, this symbiosis. So you have a, a little baby tree here and all the A's that you see, this is orangey. Uh, around the network of, of the roots is the fungi. Uh, you, see, uh, you see here these networks and at the level of the, uh, of the mineral surface, you will see way more uh, IFA. So what we've done, we expose this, this mineral rocks to this, uh, uh, to this uh, IFA and we let them react with this. And then later on, we used FIB uh, to cut at different sections, uh, different position along a single IFA, uh, we we prelave different foil of, of um, biotites, fungi um, sections, and then we did all kind of analysis, uh, TEM, uh, stem, EDM, EDX, and also stick them to look at the speciation of iron. I'm not going to go through all this, but uh, some bits I'll show you today. So this is the idea, uh, this is very simple. So you have a single IFA here, highlighted in red, and then we cut different sections. Uh, here you see the detail of the fibbing. I guess some of, I mean, most of you are maybe familiar to this, so I'm not going to go too much to detail. And then what we do is um, profiling, chemical profiling through the interface uh, of the IFA and the biotide. You, you see a detail here of this uh, interface and what we see, so you, we usually work with uh, silicon, oxygen and uh, potassium, but we do measurements of iron, magnesium and aluminum as well. So what is interesting is really this interface here, uh, where we see that there is somehow a delay into uh, the, um, the, the rise of the concentration of the potassium here. So this interface here is, a, is somehow some kind of a, an altered layer of biotite that is growing due to the uh, presence of the uh, fungi. So if we zoom in uh, into this section here, uh, we could see that there is with time, so the different section one to four is increasing uh, biotite IFA contact time. Uh, so you see that you have a depletion of this uh, potassium. So this is expected now huh, because biotite is uh, I mean, because of the structure of biotite, huh, this is the potassium is located into this uh, uh, interfoliar uh, space. So this is the, let's say, easiest element to, to move away from the, um, from the mineral and move into the, uh, into the biological system. So no big surprise here. Uh, what is also most, I mean, interesting as well is that we see also movement from uh, iron and we have also data showing the same kind of profile for um, uh, aluminum and magnesium. The, the alteration is very shallow. I mean, we are talking about, you know, 
at most 40, 50 nanometers in depth. But this is cumulated over the whole length of the IFA, which can be quite substantial. It can reach up to a millimeter, sometimes more. It depends on the, uh, on the way the fungi grow, uh, whether it's uh, exploratory uh, growth or with this or uh, like more exploitative growth um, that we can see around um, minerals like phosphorus, uh, apatite, uh, rich um, uh, rocks. So we can, I mean, there is a model uh, that we 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 created uh, based on uh, a few uh, solid state diffusion equations. You can model the flux of the uh, um, elements that of interest from the mineral into uh, the into the IFA. And we can see that this is quite substantial. Um, but the main question that we had when we saw these results was, OK, is it maybe due to an acidification process? Uh, because we all know that the uh, mineral uh, dissolution rate is really heavily pH dependent. So you know, maybe it was due to the heavily uh, acidified microenvironment. So we set out to measure pH near uh, this IFI. In, into this bio layer that I shown you before. So we did um, quite a lot of um, cofocal microscopy uh, with uh, uh, a pH sensitive probe called SNARF. Um, this pH sensitive probe is, um, is really made uh, for measuring um, pH um, within cell, but also outside. So whether you, know, you can use special conjugated um, uh, probe in order to prevent the um, the uh, the probe to enter the, uh, the the microorganism. So that's what we did, and we measure the outside of this um, uh, the pH outside of the of the IFA. And what we saw uh, was quite interesting. We saw that when the IFA was uh, in contact with the mineral with biotite, in this case, we had pH which was very low. Uh, we could not measure the pH with this probe, in fact. Uh, and when it was not in contact with the uh, surface of the biotite, we could see that the pH was around 6.5, which is somehow expected for this, uh, for this uh, macroorganism. So this was quite surprising. And to date, I mean, I've done this measurement in 2011, I think. Um, there was we i mean i could not measure the ph of this ifa so that's still a question that is um still not uh answered so it would be <laughs> it would be interesting to measure that today with new probes that can go to uh, lower ph uh, but basically what we show with this is that the fungi is really able to acidify this uh this uh is macro is macro environment and that's maybe the explanation why we see uh, an increase of the uh, of the rate of the solution at this interface. When we calculate the rate of dissolution um, uh, of this mycorrhiza based on the uh, flux of elements that we measured at the interface uh, and the pH that we measured near this uh, this IFA, we could uh, define this region as the uh, region where the uh, fungi was dissolving the mineral. So if you compare to the bulk literature, you may think, OK, that's not really fast. But then you have to consider the, the environment on which these uh, fungi are, are doing this. Uh, they are sitting basically on the basal plane of this biotite. And this basal plane has very, very low reactivity compared to the edge. And most of this dissolution uh, here, this is dominated by the edge uh, dissolution rate. So you have to deconvolute basically the two rates um, between the basal plane reactivity and the edge uh, plane. And when you do that, uh, you realize that the basal plane has a very low reactivity. Uh, and this is, let's say, three to five times lower than uh, what the fungi is doing on this basal plane. So on the basal plane, the fungi is way more active in terms of weathering than uh, the, the same pH. Uh, reactivity uh, of the basal plane. So this was quite a, a surprise to us. Um, we could not really figure out why uh, there was such a high reactivity on the basal plane of this uh, of this mineral. Um, 
in presence of this uh, of this uh, IFE. And one observation that we we did, which was also very surprising, is to look at this uh, reacted um, uh, biotite surface after the colonization of this uh, of this IFE. Um, so you see here a few few pictures of SEM. Uh, uh, of this uh, biotite surface, and you see that there is uh, what I call trenches that are formed by the presence of the IFE. This was not present before. Um, and what you saw here, uh, what we saw here is also that there was some kind of, uh, of a pulsatile uh, behavior. So we know that the fungi is growing by pulse. So you grow, you know, you, you have a turgescence that is really building up at the uh, tip of the IFE, and then it grows in one go, and then it repeats this growth. And on the biotite, you you see these pulses. You know, it lets it lets some some traces here, and yet there is material that is accumulated at the end of the pulses. So, and we know that biotite, you you know, it's kind of a of an easy. It's not very tough material. So if you humidify it a bit, and you you know you can really easily stretch it. Uh, and, and create this uh, this uh, this uh, trenches. I mean, people have been doing uh, uh, AFM on this uh, reacted uh, surface, and they saw that the depth of these uh, trenches is about 100 nanometers. It depends on on the uh, on the um, on the trenches, but it's quite substantial, substantially deep compared to you know uh, the surface. So it's really like as if the IFA was really you know, scratching, creating more surfaces, creating more edge surfaces. So I believe that after colonization, this whole surface of the biotite must be way more reactive than uh, what it was initially. So this is an observation that was really surprising. And beneath this, um, this uh, when we look at the FIB sections as well, beneath the, the IFA, we saw that there was also uh, misorientation of the crystals and didn't show this, this data here, but we did um, electron diffraction uh, in this area and beneath, and we saw that the crystals were uh, not aligned. They are not really in the same direction. So there is definitely some kind of, of a forcing of the crystalline structure of the biotite. And we saw also that there was a lot of, um, you know, cracks that are formed. Uh, and we saw that in many different um, in many different uh, FIB sections. When we compare that with the control FIB section, we didn't see that crack, that amount of cracks. I mean, this was really localized below the IFA. So that's still something that was hard to understand at the at the time. But then we we measured this uh, the, the speciation of iron, and we realized that uh, the speciation of iron was changing as well. Um, uh, we we could see that uh, there was some uh, oxidation of the uh, of the iron two in uh, in the biotite into iron three, so this was uh, something that was quite unexpected. Um, we could not really understand what was the um, you know what was the, the the process to oxidize this. Uh, uh, this iron two into iron three. So, but this is really something that uh, we measured on at least one if. Um, so we did the same as we did before. We took different fib sections, and then exposed that to um, stick them, and we saw that there was a, a huge difference between the tip of the IFA, which was not so much oxidized, and uh, the iron two iron three ratio was similar to what we we could find in uh, unreacted biotite, and the the uh, fib section that we could, you know, sampled uh, a bit uh, further up upstream the IFA, where the iron three uh, to iron two ratio was way more uh, oxidized. So that's still something we we don't understand. We don't know why there is this oxidation. Usually, fungi would uh, reduce the iron in order to assimilate it. So that's still something we are still figuring out. What was the process uh, at work here? But what is important is that um, if you oxidize a certain amount of, uh, of iron uh, into biotite, some of this iron-3 that you are oxidizing uh, is going to form subdomain of iron-3. And we believe that this um, uh, iron-3 subdomain within the biotite uh, that we could see sometimes here, 
you could see regions where the uh, this spacing was similar to uh, uh, fire drive, for example. Uh, we think that this is creating a, a strain in the uh, um, in the structure of the biotite and create these cracks. So that's that's our hypothesis at the moment. Um, but we could see that there is all kind of um, you know change in the in the uh, in the mineralogy you know in contact with the fungi. So here you see the interface between uh, the fungi here on the right and the biotite. So usually the biotite, uh, when it's uh, pristine, uh, the displacing is around 10 nanometers. Uh, but then here you, know, you, you could see regions where you have a 14 uh, angstrom. Um, sorry, this was 10 angstrom before the pristine biotite. So the, we could see that there was region uh, of 14 angstrom displacing. So which is similar to what you could find in, uh, in vermiculite, for example. We could see also these different cracks in the structures. So this is really, uh, some, there is something happening with this uh, biotite when it's reacted with the, uh, with, the, with the fungi. And we think this is related to the uh, oxidation processes. So this is, you know, just to show you that, I mean, this is just a cherry picking in many different, uh, uh, aspect of this um, fungal mineral weathering. I could have talked about uh, biotite weathering, where, where we see also a huge increase of the of the weathering rate with this uh, mineral. So, what is important to understand is is that the fungi really accelerate the mineral uh, weathering, and for the plants, and it does that into in environment that are really hostile for the plant. For example, where you have very shallow soil or very low amount of of, um, of organic matter in a soil the fungi really predominates the uh, the flux of nutrients from the mineral soil basically into uh, the plants so fungi are really helping the plants in in tough conditions let's say and this is really um yeah if you think of the transition from you know uh, acres the life from acres system into the land uh yeah, this would be the ideal partner in doing this transition. You know, uh, the plants would really benefit from this uh, partnership with fungi. So here is a, a little sketch that I have done for that uh, summarize a bit the action of the fungi for the plants. So <clears throat> the plant gives some uh, some uh, carbon to the uh, to ensure the growth of the IFA when it needs um, uh, nutrients. Uh, the fungi will grow. Um, then there would be some biomechanical forcing, channeling. Uh, there would be some acidification processes, some uh, sometimes oxidation um, of the mineral, uh, especially in the case of uh, of biotites. Um, and then you would create, um, you know, a, a layer of, of uh, uh, altered material that will tend to grow, but. Uh, you know, at some point, the flux of elements, uh, I model that the flux of elements uh, would decrease really uh, substantially. And therefore, there would be an incentive for the for the uh, IFA to grow and to contact new uh, surfaces. Uh, so there would be some kind of a, of a feedback uh, process, let's say, that ensure that the fungi will continue to grow uh, on the surface, at least of the biotite. And, uh, you renew the flux of uh, of uh, nutrients from the mineral into uh, the uh, into the IFA, and therefore you have the cycle that starts again. So, I think there is uh, you know this this whole process has been studied in in uh, in laboratory uh, mostly and in very limited uh, set of minerals, um, but I think there is uh, an interest to 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 expand this uh, this research. Recently, I've seen that um, there, were, there was a, an interesting study by uh, uh, Damien Daval done in the uh, Eastern France in the Strandbar uh, catchment, where they really uh, measure, at least they try to measure uh, the um, weathering rates of, um, of olivine in natural conditions. And they found that 16% of this uh, weathering rate was assigned to uh, to uh, fungi, so I think it's it's quite it's quite substantial. Uh, that's deserving, you know, more research. I think because I think olivine is a specific cases as well, 
Um, so it's a mineral which contains a lot of iron. So the iron would tend to somehow block the uh, the weathering, I think, for for fungi. So I think this is you know this this was the research that I was doing when I was postdoc and early into my position here at, at ULB, and then I you know expand my views into deep times. So I I got interested into fossil uh, by interacting with people that work in Congo. You know we are in Belgium, so. Congo is some, you know, somehow related to Belgium for good and more also bad reasons. But um, what we have here is uh, an unprecedented record of um, Congolese geology um, in the uh, Tervuren um, Museum. So I got uh, access to this uh, core and, you know, I started to play with these uh, samples. And I started to understand a bit better the association between uh, plants, early plants, and the uh, this fungi. And I got interested uh, into the neural proterozoic uh, times because this is, and I'll show you better, uh, better later, this is really the period where everything happens for this, uh, the creation of this partnership between the plants and the fungi. So what we know is uh, that the early plants uh, they have the ability to interact with an unprecedented diversity of fungi. So you see here the liver roots, they are this, you know, they are very minute plants. You can find them in a very humid, um, you know, environment. If you go to a, a shadowy, you know, spring, you know, the spray of water will, um, you know, humidify the, uh, the soil or uh, the surface of a rock. And if you look closely, sometimes you may find this kind of uh, little plants. They look nothing, but they are super important to me, I think. So they are, they are part of this uh, group, this Marcantio Fita. And people in, uh, in Sheffield and also in Leeds have been analyzing this, um, uh, the ability of this plant to bind to different types of fungi, primitive fungi. Um, so you have this uh, mucormycotina, you have uh, glomeromycotina, the basidiomycet and the ascomycet, they are more evolved fungi. But you see that this plant can talk, let's say, uh, with this fungi. They can create mycorrhiza association with this fungi. And this is really, really telling a lot. Um, I think this, these plants, they were really uh, the key uh, into the colonization of lands. And this is something that has not been reproduced in later uh, plants, much, or much later plants, only the conifers can really uh, achieve this kind of uh, thing, fit. So um, when you really look at these uh, liver roots, they are really primitive. They are dating back to the really early plants uh, like Ordovicians, Silurian, they, are, they were there already. So I got interested into uh, the early records of uh, fossil of fungi. And when we, when you talk about records of fungi uh, in geological times, uh, you are talking about the Rhiney shirt. This is the, the, the you know, the most well-known um, uh, rocks for um, uh, studying uh, fungi fossils. And what is striking in this, um, in these uh, rocks is that you find already uh, quite a large diversity. If you look at the, the, the different groups of, of, um, of fungi, this is a, a very simplified uh, phylogenetic trees of the um, of fungi. So Ascomicota and Basitomicota, they are really the most evolved. Um, they were called the higher fungi. And then you have glomeromycotina, uh, zygomycotina, and chytridiomycotina. These groups, they have been changing all the time. So I simplify here. Um, so they, they are the, you know, the lower fungi, basically. And in, in Rhiney shirt, basically, you find all four of these, ascomycotina, glomeromycotina, zygomycotina, and uh, chytridiomycotina. So only basidiomycotina is absent. So that means that at around 400 million years, there were already a large, you know, the diversity of fungi were already there. So that means that this diversity must have been evolving way earlier in history. 
So that's where things, um, that's where the, the things are starting to get really complicated. Because when you look at the uh, fungi uh, records back in time, in Precambrian times, this is really messy. Um, well, you have in 2005, you have uh, a group from China that discovered uh, filaments. I don't know if you see my cursor here. Um, but basically, these filaments here, they claim it to be fungal, of fungal nature. And you have this, uh, this kind of algae, these cocoids, um, that are present there. So they're, they're interpreting this, uh, these uh, pictures as um, you know, an early lichen-like uh, fossil. And it's dating back to 600 million years. Um, so we have also other type of enigmatic uh, fungi, assimilated fossil, uh, putative fungi. Uh, we have Tapania uh, from uh, Nick Butterfield. Uh, so basically, it's kind of a potato <laughs> shape fossil with kind of ornament. So this looks like uh, filaments. So this was interpreted as the early fungi. And then really later on uh, in 2017, there was claims um, of a fungi which was much older, like 2.4 billion years old. So these structures here, so they are chloriterized uh, network of filaments. So it's really hard to, there was no traces of organic matter at all. Um, but the, when you look at the morphology of these networks, it really resembles really strongly to, uh, to fungi. You see anastomo, uh, anastomo so fusion of uh, two different uh, filaments. So this is really uh, uh, something that only fungi can do. So this was interpreted as uh, a fungi uh, living deep into the uh, Ocean, um, you know, deep in the ocean floor, into um, into uh, uh, basaltic uh, vesicles. So this is really specialized. Uh, this was really uh, a weird setting for fungi because this is most probably uh, anoxygenic. Um, so you know, this really sh shook a lot of people uh, that were interested into fungal uh, records. And then in 2019, there is uh, another uh, fossil of fungi that has been uh, discovered from uh, Arctic, in the Arctic, from the Neoproterozoic, around 900 to uh, a billion years old. Uh, and what they did is also, uh, so most of these studies are, are mostly, um, you know, they are studying the, the shape of this uh, of this fungi, and really, really rarely they were looking at the um, the quality of the organic matter and the structure of the organic matter, and trying to identify this organic matter and relate that to uh, uh, a fungal uh, um, fossil. Let's say uh, this study did that in a way. Uh, it's you know you can criticize that, but uh, uh, at least they, they they tried their best. So they did uh, uh, FTIR uh, measurements on this. Uh, on this filament, and they, they found what they think is uh, chitin. So um, when I looked at that, and I, you know, I thought maybe we can do better than that, and that's uh, that's where I studied uh, um, this core in uh, <clears throat> in the um, Museum of Tervuren, because some of my colleagues here in uh, in uh, in Brussels, uh, Alain Prea and uh, is a PhD student, Frank Del Pomdor. They attract my attention to uh, fungal, I mean, what was claimed fungi at the time in 1973. Uh, there was a paleontologist from India that claimed to have found uh, a fungal network into uh, a core that was contained in the, uh, in the Africa Museum. So uh, we uh, looked at uh, fib sections uh, that we we've done on this uh, on this core, and we found some of this uh, filament. So this is a picture that was taken from this uh, paper in uh, in in the seventies. So you see these filaments, and what was interesting is that uh, later uh, specialists uh, in the nineties, you know, uh, 
they look at these uh, pictures and they say, well, okay, this is not fungi, this is cyanobacteria and tubular of cyanobacteria, and that's it. And discussion was closed. And I thought, okay, maybe we could have a look at this uh, fungal network again and, and see whether this is uh, cyanobacteria or not. And that's what we are doing. I'm thinking that I'm running late at the moment, so I will try to that's go faster. Well, that's okay. I mean, yeah. no time still. Yeah. So, so this is a, a log of the core. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but this is mostly we found the fungi in uh, well the, the fossil fungi in a, in a dolomitic shale level here, in what is called a BC B2C uh, eight, and um, the, 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 the paleo environment of this uh, of this section here, uh, it's really sub um, aerial. It's a kind of a perennial lagoon. Uh, sometimes that has been uh, drought. Uh, we see that in uh, in the different uh, fib section, uh, not fib section, but in the different fin sections that we have done. Um, uh, paleontologists uh, and also sedimentologists have interpreted this uh, this uh, paleo environment to be uh, yeah, really close to the uh, terrestrial uh, domain. And when we look at the these new uh, fin sections, uh, we could see this kind of um, uh, structures. Uh, they are quite large. I mean, these networks of filaments, um, they are about 500 by 500 uh, micron and when we look at this in a mic in a optical microscopy we could see this is black translucent uh, non-translucid and you see this there is like this uh, uh, branching here um, this is natural color here you see this black filaments here they are branching here and uh, there are multiple branching several other branching the uh, uh, the length is quite large of these filaments and uh, the, 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 when you look at the, uh, the, the width, it's uh, really around, you know, the, the average is about six microns. So this is what we, you can expect from, uh, from fungal network. Um, so this is more pictures, SEM pictures here. Um, and the interior, the interior is uh, hollow sometimes. Uh, and this is cylindrical. Uh, so we assign this cylindrical uh, um, uh, uh, preservation to the fact that this is uh, dolomitized. So the uh, the process of you know usually the the, the, the filaments and and all you know fossils they are flattened because of the compaction. In this case, this was uh, this is not the the, the, the uh, this is not what happened uh, because of this dolomitization. The um, the, uh, the the fungal network stayed uh, as uh, in 3D, so this is quite uh, exceptional. Um, and the big question was uh, was whether or not this was fungal. Uh, based on on the shape, you can you can have a, an argument, but this is really not uh, very strong. So the whole the whole thing was whether or not we could identify chitin into this uh, into this fossil. Uh, we know that chitin can be preserved uh, uh, very well into uh, in uh, the geological records. Uh, it has been found in uh, arthropods, but also in uh, demo sponge uh, from uh, almost 500 million years old. So, you know, this is something that can be preserved really well. So we set out to do this. Um, but first, I did the classical, um, you know, characterization for. Uh, for um, organic matter in, a, in a, you know, when you want to look at fossil. Uh, we did Raman, and so we identified the typical D and G bands at 16 uh, and 1350. Uh, and we started to play with this uh, spectra. We did some mapping. Um, we measured also the peak temperature of the uh, of this organic matter. You can derive that using uh, a very a nice abac. Um, I think this is um, somebody from Paris who did that. Uh, Be um, Besac, um, and you could derive the peak temperature that uh, the um, that the organic matter has been experienced. So 
for our foci, this is 150 to, to 250 degrees. And in this range of temperature, you can preserve uh, chitin. It's not completely, it's not going to be uh, dissolved. And what is uh, interesting is that I, I did this ratio between uh, these two peaks, so this uh, G band and the D band, the D1 here, in order to derive the structural order of the uh, of these organic remains. So the structural order, uh, this ratio, I'm going to use that in conjunction with um, um, a ratio that has been used many times um, in fossil research. Uh, this ratio is the uh, methyl to methylene uh, peak that you can find in this uh, aliphatic region of the FTLR spectra. You see that you have a very large uh, peak here of the aliphatic region. So you have these uh, two uh, peaks here, these two peaks at uh, uh, 2960 and 2920. You can use that to derive the degree of branching of the organic matter that you are looking at. I'm not going to go into detail here of all the whole spectra here. What is important is what we found here in this region, the, um, the fingerprint region at uh, uh, 1540 and uh, 1650. This is the amide one and amide two peaks. And so this was really gave, giving us a lot of hopes because this is really what you need to see in uh, to, in order to, to identify chitin, because chitin is a is a, an acetyl glucosamine uh, compound. So you need to find an amine or an amide group into this uh, into this um, fossil in order to claim the presence of uh, of chitin. And we also find a small peak of uh, of. Um, of a piranose, so it's a leftover of a, of a sugar or carbohydrate. Uh, so this is, you know, the two pieces here are important. Um, this strengthened our claim of the presence of uh, of chitin. But what is, what is important is that I use this ratio uh, of this uh, CH3 and CH2 peaks uh, in order with this, uh, in, in conjunction with this um, uh, structural order index that I use, that I derive from the uh, from the Moraman, in order to 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 separate, um, uh, well, let's say to separate whether to to determine whether this uh, fungi uh, was, I mean, this fossil was coming from a prokaryotic organic matter or prokaryotic, you know, um, uh, organism or uh, eukaryotic organisms, and uh, so. This is quite a new uh, <clears throat> way, I think, to to separate these two groups. And this is, uh, so I use different data from uh, Q and et al. from 2015, 2018, in order to separate these two groups. And for our fungi fossil, we fell uh, really well into the region where we uh, expect uh, the eukaryotic fossil to fall. So this is really uh, uh, a nice uh, fit here. Uh, for this uh, for this fossil, we could she we could show that this is an eukaryotic uh, origin for this fossil. So I'm not going to spend too much time on explaining zanes. I guess everybody's familiar to this. Um, what is important here in this slide is so we did a fib section here in this uh, on this network. We placed that into the onto uh, zanes, and what we see is three main peaks. Uh, here, this is the orange uh, spectra that you need to see. So we see uh, uh, an aromatic peak, very prominent. This is normal because of the carogenization of this uh, fossil. But we see also a shoulder here in this region, which is what you would expect for the uh, um, amide carboxylic uh, uh, region. And we see also a peak here into uh, uh, ketone and aliphatic region at 286. So basically what, you know, how you, you would interpret that is that uh, this peak that you, you would find in the, into, the, into the chitin has been degraded into these two peaks here. So the aliphatic, uh, uh, you know, this uh, aromatic uh, peak is due to the carogenization of the fossil. And then you have uh, a phenolic peak here that is really coming also the, from the degradation of this um, of this organic matter. But what's important is that we still see a shoulder here into this amide, uh, amide peak. 
So I'll show you quickly the, the same uh, xanes, but this is on the N edge here. And we see also we have a, a, a N-amidyl peak here for the uh, nitrogen. So this is consistent. I mean, this is not diagnostic of the presence of uh, chitin, but this is still uh, a strong indication that uh, you know, this is consistent with the signature of chitin being present into this uh, into this fossil. But what's really what really nailed the uh, presence of um, of the chitin into this uh, into this fungi uh, fossil was the um, the presence of uh, the labeling that we've done with uh, with confocal microscopy, fluorescent microscopy. So we use a specific dye for uh, um, for chitin. And then we expose the, uh, the some regions of this filament to this uh, dye, and then we did confocal microscopy on it. So you see different pictures here. So some are uh, completely um, uh, dark, some are uh, whitish. So the whitish show you the presence of um, the positive presence of, of chitin, and the dark here show you the natural autofluorescence. So organic matter can have a natural autofluorescence. So you need to uh, check for a false positive signature. So in this case, we see that the dark air, this is the organic matter that we've, we've taken from a different slice of the core, of the Kanchi core. So we see that the organic matter, the old organic matter um, doesn't react with the, uh, with, the, with the labeling. So there is no big problem. So this is natural autofluorescence. So this is the fluorescence that we measure when the uh, labeling was present. So the organic matter doesn't react with this labeling. So it seems that you know this labeling uh, is really uh, going to target you know uh, uh, the uh, chitin even if the uh, the organic matter has been matured. So there is no false positive. Basically, what I'm that's what I'm going to to say here. But the interesting thing is that the network that I've shown you before uh, on ACM, uh, so we we recognize it now. You know, we we see this this branching here, um, and what we see is also that we have this cylindrical signature here. So this is really something that uh, indicate chitin being preserved, colocalized with this uh, with the membrane of these filaments, and we saw also some uh, some uh, septum. So this was also a bit uh, surprising because septum in a fungi is uh, synonym of uh, quite high, higher fungi, so evolved fungi. So if we look at uh, this really ancient fungi, it's quite, quite a surprise. But um, uh, in fact, when you know the the septum are very, very unfrequent. We see a few septum, and sometimes they are not complete. So you know, in other words, they are not, uh, obst you know, obstructing uh, the whole cell, uh, and this is really what you expect when you look at uh, higher fungi. There's this is really a, a really a barrier between the different cells of the fungi. In this case, this was really not the case. We we could see that this is uh, incomplete uh, septum, and this is quite rare to see them into this um, into this network. So. This is really uh, what you would find in in a uh, in a very uh, primitive group of fungi, which is called Blastocladiomycota. Um, so we think uh, this is really an hypothesis here uh, that this is um, you know this is this kind of group that we we are seeing here um, in this uh, in this fossil. So this is my last slide. Um, so. What I've shown you here is that fungi are important nowadays uh, because they sustain a lot of the uh, major forest and bear major uh, plant biomass on Earth. But they were really important into one of the major, the most important, one of the most important transition of life from uh, liquid to uh, to land surface. And I think fungi were there, and they were really uh, helping the uh, the first organisms to step on the land. And what is really uh, striking is that this connection probably started earlier than we think. Um, it started probably already into uh, into this you know little ponds or this lagoon um, that we, we we looked in 
uh, in this uh, Congo, uh, in this Congo core, um, because there was a in really interesting studies from uh, uh, the freeze um, that showed that uh, some group of uh, green algae, they have the basically the the the, the genes, uh, the genome packaging, if you like, uh, to talk to the fungi. Uh, so I think this association uh, started, you know, in these ponds that uh, are subjected to drought period. So, you know, this um, fungi and green algae, they, they interact physically to each other. Maybe they were parasites at some points, who knows? And that's maybe that's the, 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 the right environment to create this, uh, this symbiosis. And some people have been trying this um, you know, to associate uh, green algae with fungi, and it worked after a couple of uh, generations. You know, they were uh, forming a, a free living association. So I think this is really the kind of environment that are really essential for this uh, for this transition. And I think what we have in the Congo core is maybe one of these environments. In this um, in this core, there have been a lot of green algae, archit architage of all kinds that have been identified. So far, we haven't seen this connection between uh, these filaments and the algae, but maybe it's just a question of looking really for this kind of, uh, of weird structures. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's all I think what I have to say. I think I have no slide anymore. Yes, some people to thank at ULB, the Gave Z, uh, Leon Benning, and also some people from the Carnegie Institutes, people at Diamond as well, who helped me a lot with the, uh, the Xanes, and of course the museum uh, here in Brussels. Okay, well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, and it was a very fascinating journey through fungi world, I will admit. Um, we're gonna take a few questions. Uh, so I know Francois has raised his hand, but anyone else have a question in the meantime, while Francois is asking question, either you can raise your hand or wave at me, type in the chat, either one, so. Francois, you can start. Uh, thank you, Steve. Merci, Steve, for <clears throat> l'excellent exposé. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I was very interested by this um, older work, uh, oxidation phenomena of the biotite by, by, by the fungi. And um, one question, of course, the, these fungi, they have a metabolism at this moment, which is uh, oxygenic respiration, right? Is it correct? And is, can it be quantified or uh, in some Yes, way? I think uh, it can be quantified. Um, I never tried, um, but um, yeah, it could be quantified, yes. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's quite fashionable these days to invoke, when, once you have a kind of oxygenic respiration, you have a reactive oxygen spaces moving yeah. all around. Yeah, and uh, and it, it's really fashionable in geochemical cycles now that it could really account for a few percent, maybe several tens of percent of the oxygen flux, and uh, and in that case, of course, uh, it would be interesting to relate uh, the oxidation of biotite to uh, generation of uh, reactive oxygen yeah. species. And uh, I, I was wondering because uh, you showed very nice uh, pH uh, probe images. Uh, I I know there. Are are uh, probes for the reactive oxygen species and, there yeah. are and things like that. So I was wondering whether there was research doing done in that direction. And I like to do that. I, tr I tried, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Colin Hansel. Um, yeah, for the manganese. Yeah, 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 yeah. for the manganese, yeah. she used. Uh, uh, I don't remember the 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 uh, the name of the of the compound, but I, mm -hmm. I I saw the picture where you see the IFA and you have um, this blue color that showed that there was. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. superoxide uh, O2 minus present. So yeah. that's something I really would like to do. Uh, I tried here in Belgium to convince the FNRs to give me money to do that, but uh, ah, okay. <laughs> they, were not, they were not really keen. <laughs> uh, okay, but, but yeah, that's, that seems to be very interesting and that could be, uh, you know, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the trajectory of uh, oxygen radicals and things like that from the photosynthetic Thing yep. to the to the fungi, to the, yeah, that that's a really uh, exciting uh, field. And I yeah, yeah, the, there, there is a lot of uh, people here are working on, for example, lacas for degradation of organic matter in in soil, mm -hmm. in wood, for example. And okay. 
Yeah, that's something I, 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 would, I would love to do, but you know, mm. okay. this experiment with fungi, they are really killers. And I, I, I was really happy to have uh, people like Jonathan Link to really give me a hand on that. And so far, I'm, I've been trying here in Brussels to set up this, you know, this, this thing um, to create, again, this, this micro, microcosms. It's, you know, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've been unlucky with, we started that. And then COVID came, so uh, yeah. all, all yeah, died. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> en tout cas, merci beaucoup. C'était extrêmement intéressant. You're welcome. <laughs>